Yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the workshop. Today we're going to hear about nutrition after transplant facts and myths about popular diets. And there's handouts in the back of the room. My name is Peggy Burkhardt, and I will be your moderator today. I'm looking forward to hearing from our guest speaker about this important topic. This session is designed to be interactive, so we're going to ask that you hold your questions until after the presentation is completed. The presentation will be about 35 minutes, and then we'll take uh, questions. And we ask that when you uh, address a question, you use the microphone in the middle of the room. Holly Harrington is a registered dietitian and certified diabetes educator in the Center for Lifestyle Medicine at Northwestern Medical Facility, I'm sorry, Faculty Foundation. Her clinical interests include weight loss, bariatric surgery, diabetes management, cardiovascular health, gastrointestinal health, and prenatal nutrition. Previously, she worked both as an inpatient and outpatient dietitian at Rush University Medical Center. Ms. Harrington is a er, uh, requested expert for media outlets and has been featured in the U.S. News and World Report, Men's Health, and the Chicago Tribune. Quite impressive. Please join me today in welcoming Ms. Harrington. Hello, good morning. How's everyone's morning so far? Fantastic. Can you put this over? Oh, of course. No. I thought I may have a lay. I just sort of practiced that before. <laughs> I'm Holly. I am a registered dietitian. I don't just play one on TV. So <laughs> today we are going to go through some, maybe some crazy di diet things you might have heard, kind of what we should be looking at or what we shouldn't look at, kind of like facts and myths about popular diets. So usually when I talk to this step, uh, excuse me, when I do this presentation in January, that's usually like National Diet Month, so everyone's kind of hopping on the diet bandwagon. But since it's swimsuit season coming up, maybe you guys have also looked at a couple of diet things out there. All right, so today we're going to talk about nutrition and recovery, of course, after a transplant, strategies for navigating some food issues, good or fad diets, what is a healthy diet, talk about some diet supplements, and getting some physical activity in there. It's everyone's favorite, right? <laughs> All right, so diet and nutrition following transplant. This probably isn't an unfamiliar topic to a lot of you. You might have heard this before from dietitians or other medical providers about eating healthy after transplant, maintaining a healthy weight, eating our really wonderful healthy foods that supply our body with calories and nutrients for energy repair, recovering, and healing. And, you know, overall, when we think about what is a healthy diet, we think about a healthful eating pattern that includes fruits and vegetables, moderate amounts of whole grains, plant-based protein sources, and modest portions of, of meat, like fish and poultry, lean meats, non-fat or low-fat dairy foods. So I put this on here that a plant-based diet may actually promote health and reduce risk of cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. Who's heard of a plant-based diet? You will, by the end of today, know what a plant-based <laughs> diet is. So I have a lot of things I like to talk about. So if everyone got the yellow PowerPoint presentation here, there's a lot of slides on here. I wanted to have all these slides in there so you could have the information to take home, but I'm probably not going to have enough time to really go into all these slides in detail. So we might skip through a couple of these just a little bit. So I talked just a second ago about this overall healthful diet and our fruits and vegetables and our whole grains. But then we also have the neutropenic immunosuppressed diet that also plays a role in there. These might be some words you're also familiar with, that neutropenic diet for an immunosuppressed patient. So the neutropenic diet is typically followed for the first three months after a transplant. You may follow it longer if you're on immunosuppressant medication. And this diet is designed to help you reduce your risk of developing some foodborne illnesses or eating some food that may cause some bacteria. When we have an immunosuppressed state in our bodies, we can't fight that bacteria off as well. So a foodborne illness for one person may be really bad, but for, some per for someone else who is immunosuppressed, it may be doubly bad. So that's why we, we put you on this, this neutropenic diet, to kind of reduce the risk that you may come in contact with some nasty bacteria or a foodborne illness. So all centers, all transplant centers are going to talk to you about this, and you might have heard these rules, like not eating raw or undercooked meat. 
which I really wouldn't have anybody eat raw or undercooked meat. <laughs> or raw or undercooked eggs, so no like rocky milkshakes there. Raw undercooked seafood, so if you like sushi, make sure we get the cooked seafood, not the raw. Non-pasteurized milk products, which in our country, we're not usually having the non-pasteurized kind. Most of our milk products do go through pasteurization. Cheeses with mold, soft cheeses, raw honey, or raw nuts. So these foods can have a, a higher risk of a bacteria and a higher risk of a foodborne illness there that if you're on a neutropenic or immunosuppressed diet, we kind of want to avoid these foods. All right, we also know that after treatment, we can get some lovely side effects there. Dry mouth, difficulty swallowing, taste changes, nausea or vomiting or no appetite, diarrhea and constipation. So when it's difficult to eat, we of course have some nasty side effects, unwanted weight loss, malnutrition, reduced healing time, which could also interfere with um, heart function, liver function. We feel less energetic, sluggish and tired and even have some feelings of depression. If I can't eat, it actually makes you feel kind of depressed. So we even have things like pleasure feeds we give people sometimes, so we don't feel that depressed feeling. So what's tricky here is you may have also heard this. We actually want you to eat. We want you to get those calories in. We want you to get that protein in. Most of the time, your calories and protein needs are double what they were before. But how, it's so hard to get these calories and protein in when I'm having dry mouth, when I have mouth sores. So overall, we want you to eat, even if it's not always the healthiest thing. We want you to get some food in there. So this may be some things I'm going to kind of skip over kind of quickly. Um, most of the stuff I think some of you have heard. If not, here it is in writing for you to take home. So if I do have a sore mouth or throat, I can definitely not eat dry toast. I can go for some soft, moist foods, add some extra sauces. Avoiding alcohol, citrus, or caffeine, that might actually cause those mouth sores to hurt a little more. I mean, think about the whole paper cut with a lemon juice poured over it analogy we used to hear. That's kind of what I'm doing if I have a mouth sore. Experiment with the, the temperatures of your food, warm, cool, or icy, to find out which is the most soothing for your mouth. And of course, drinking plenty of fluids. <laughs> That's what I'm doing right now, because I'm having some dry mouth. So focusing on warm or cool milk-based beverages. Milk actually creates like a film or a coating in the throat, which is why a lot of singers don't like to drink milk, just if you're ever on Jeopardy, now you know that. <laughs> so it can actually kind of create a coating there and can help people with mouth sores. Managing taste and smell changes, that absolutely happens. So one, eat the foods that appeal to you. Remember, our number one goal is just to eat. Moist foods, naturally sweet food, foods, think about frozen melon or frozen grapes, tends to kind of help um, with taste. Tart foods, bitter foods, these foods that are kind of on the extremes can help a little bit with changes in taste and smell. Red meat is usually less appealing to a lot of people, kind of a metallic taste I may get in there. So trying poultry, fish, kind of some more bland types of meats. Um, definitely brushing your teeth and your tongue. There's also neutralizing rinses. You can make your own at home. Your doctor can prescribe a neutralizing rinse. So it's like some uh, salt and baking soda solution can kind of neutralize some taste in your mouth and sometimes helps people feel like they can taste a little bit better. Nausea and vomiting. This, of course, is another big one. So if I'm feeling very nauseated, I want to have small portions of food. I don't want to put a big, giant meal in that's going to make me feel a bit more nauseated. So eating foods or sipping clear liquids at a room temperature are usually easier to tolerate. Avoiding high-fat, greasy foods. Think about when you're feeling nauseated and then you may eat a cheeseburger. That's not going to sit very well. And then we have the bland diet, which is also called the brat diet. Think bananas, rice, applesauce, and toast. Kind of what we have given our kids when they were toddlers and they kind of had an upset stomach. Bland foods usually sit a little bit better. Things like crackers or ginger ale. So sipping on beverages between meals rather than with meals kind of helps reduce the volume in your stomach. And then, of course, try to stay sitting up and keep your head raised for about an hour after eating because we know that eating and lying down doesn't always make a great combination when you're feeling kind of sick, too. If you're having trouble eating at all, just a general poor appetite, remember, we just want to get foods in there. So go for the foods you know you, you like, you know you can tolerate. Trying to eat five or six small meals a day rather than big meals. Oftentimes people think, I just need to eat big meals and get more food in at one time. But what happens when I do that is then I'm not hungry the rest of the day and I've got a lot of food in my stomach. I'm not feeling great. So start with high protein foods when your appetite is the strongest. Remember, we want to get protein into you after transplant. 
When your appetite is the strongest, take advantage of it. I don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow, I don't know what's gonna happen the rest of the day, but right now I'm feeling okay, so I'm gonna try to get some foods in there. That's also the time to try to be physically active or prepare foods. When I'm tired, when I'm not feeling very well, I don't wanna go anywhere near the kitchen. So when I have a day or a moment when I'm feeling pretty good, take advantage of that time and try to get some foods made, prepared, or try to eat some at that time. That goes along with fatigue. Probably the most common side effect after treatment is fatigue. I'm just too tired. I don't want to cook. I'm just going to eat whatever I have around. So trying to prepare foods, cook foods, and eat foods when you feel your best. Take advantage of that time. Freeze foods. I can cook a lot at one time. I can cook on a weekend. I can do crock pot cooking. I can freeze as much as I can so that later on I'm able to grab something and pop it in the microwave. Rely on your friends and family members to help prepare meals for you using the, the crock pot. Everybody in here have a crock pot or know what a crock pot is, a slow cooker? I love the crock pot. I always say it's like having a maid. I've got someone else cooking for me. Someone else is in the kitchen working while I'm doing something else. Even meal delivery. There are so many meal delivery services these days. You might have heard of like uh, Blue Apron or HelloFresh. So if you're interested in finding out what some of those are, I think I have some on the resources page on the last. I'd be happy to tell you about those after the presentation. So meal delivery programs can be wonderful. Someone else cooks and brings it to you. So it can be a little bit pricey, but for a lot of patients, it's worth the money. The biggest one I tend to see in my clinic is the unwanted weight gain. We've told you for months, eat, just eat something. You need triple the calories. You need double the protein. We want to get foods into you. And then five, six months after treatment, I'm no longer on an immunosuppressed diet, but I'm still eating all these calories. That's why I really see people start to gain weight months after treatment. Coupled with, I've been tired, so I haven't gotten any activity. I've been kind of sitting around a lot. Lots of medications, such as steroids, can cause weight gain. Steroids make us hungry. They are nasty little suckers. They do great work, but they make us so hungry. My diet restrictions are lifted. I'm no longer on a neutropenic diet. I'm no longer restricted on this or restricted on that. I can eat what I want. We also tend to eat more in response to stress. And like I said, eating at treatment levels. That's what I was talking about before. I've been eating this high-calorie diet. I don't really need to keep eating this high-calorie diet but I continue and now I see weight going up. So today, that's what we're talking about. What am I doing with these if I have some unwanted weight gain? We wanna go back to following those healthy diet principles. And if you have a dietitian at your center, someone you're friends with in your community, definitely talk to your registered dietitian about finding a program that's right for you. There is no right diet. Every diet is going to work differently for someone else. So having a specific plan for you is going to be one of the best courses of action. So I said there's no right diet. Now what about some that may not be 100% awesome? So I have this up here, and I said eating a healthy diet, and every plan is different for everybody else. Why is healthy eating so hard? Well, one, I've been on a neutropenic diet. I don't know what to eat anymore or I haven't felt like eating, or I go onto the internet and Google gives me 9,000 different things. Eating healthy can be so confusing these days. I'm told, eat this, don't eat that. You can only eat this food if it's combined with another food. I can only eat this food if I cut it in half and turn it upside and walk on top of my head. So there's so many directions out there. So today we're gonna kinda go over what to be careful with and really what is a healthy diet. Like I said, if I go onto Google, I'm gonna to find tons of information of what to do and what not to do. A lot of diets out there are fad diets. Have you guys heard that term fad diet before? A fad diet can be anything. It doesn't have to necessarily be a lemon juice cleanse. A fad diet can be any type of diet that's gonna promise quick weight loss or unrealistic things to do. So most of these diets are developed by people who really have no science or health background. They're very unrealistic to follow. And if weight loss occurs, it's usually from a deficit of calories and not because there's some magic to it. So avoiding fruit during the day and only eating fruit at night, there's no magic to that. This is one of my favorite quotes from Dr. David Katz, who works at Yale. He says, if it's not something a parent can share with a child, it's apt to be very questionable. So anytime you want to put yourself on a diet or kind of follow the latest and greatest plan, think, would I have done this with my kids? Would I have let my kids do this? One thing I always ask my patients when they talk about skipping meals, we've got some meal skippers in here, skipping breakfast, or maybe I don't like to have lunch, or I'm too busy for dinner. 
I always say, what would you do if you found out that your kids skipped breakfast today? Oh, I'd be mad. What would happen if you know that your kid went to school today and wasn't provided lunch? Oh, I'd be so mad. I'd be in that teacher's office. I'll say, why? Well, that's my kid. My kid needs to eat. I'll say, well, so do you. You are just as important. So what we do for our kids, we need to do for ourselves also. So these are, in 2015, these were ranked the top worst diets by U.S. News and World Report. Have you guys heard of some of these? The paleo, the gluten-free, blood type diet, master cleanse, that's my favorite. The baby food diet, who's eating baby food? <laughs> the Dukin diet and the raw food diet. You guys heard of some of these? All right, so I'm gonna go through a few of these for you. So sorry, I said that there. Oh, sure. The paleo diet, this one's actually been around for a little while and I'm afraid it's gonna stick for a little while because it hasn't really died out. Paleo diet is we're going to eat like our ancestors. Our ancestors didn't have any of the health problems that we have, so they must have been doing something right. I don't know about you guys, but I was not around back then. So I don't know if they, what, you know, if they didn't have the problems that we had. I do know they didn't live as long as we do now. But the paleo diet has its good and its bad. What I love about the paleo diet is that it recommends lean meats and plenty of fruits and vegetables. It discourages highly processed foods like our junk foods, like our Doritos and our Twinkies. Discourages a lot of refined sugars. I have no problem with that. The diet tends to be low in sodium and exercise is highly encouraged. Sounds great. Cons is that the paleo diet eliminates entire food groups. And so it does say this one food group is bad, avoid all of these food groups. And when I look at those food groups, I, it, it asks you to omit, like these are really healthful foods. So that's always a sign of a fad diet, when a diet has asked you to omit an entire food group that may actually be healthy, like whole grains or legumes or dairy. A con of the paleo is that it asks you to choose maybe the wrong types of meat or fat. It kind of encourages a lot of high fat meat products, which is definitely not something we want to do because high fat meat products and unhealthy fats are not so great for our heart. So the paleo diet has a lack of variety and a lack of nutrient intake. It can be dangerous to follow for people who have specific diseases like any kind of cardiac issue. And it can also be pretty costly. I don't know if anyone's ever looked into it, but a lot of these foods that you have to follow on this diet can be pretty expensive. Another popular diet is the gluten-free diet. Now there are people who need to follow a gluten-free diet, and I'm not speaking to that population. I saw um, one of my favorite clips one time. It was, uh, I think, a Jimmy Kimmel. Anybody ever watch Jimmy Kimmel? And he did his on-the-street interview, and he went out and he's asking people, do you follow a gluten-free diet? Yes, I do. Well, what is gluten? And how many people could answer that question? Like, not a one. <laughs> do you guys know what gluten is? Now you do. Gluten's a protein. It's found in wheat and rye and barley. People who have celiac disease, gluten intolerance, or irritable bowel syndrome cannot process this pro protein. Celiac disease is actually an autoimmune digestive disease where the villi, or like the fingers in your gut, are actually destroyed. So eating something with gluten in it is very, very painful for people who have celiac disease. Um, it also interferes with absorption, so people who have celiac disease are usually very deficient in some vitamins and minerals. But guess what? Only about 1% of our population actually has celiac disease. As far as gluten intolerance and irritable bowel, this is kind of newer. Um, it's kind of emerged more in the research. We do know that if you have IBS, especially IBS with diarrhea, gluten is going to light you up. So we usually do encourage people to avoid gluten if you have irritable bowel. Typically, family members who have an autoimmune disease actually have a 25% greater risk of developing celiac disease. So these are the people who really, really, truly need to follow a gluten-free diet. So why do other people follow a gluten-free diet? I'll come back to that one. So I thought I had another slide in there. I'm so sorry. So I have people come to my office and they say, I want to lose weight, and my doctor recommended gluten-free. My friend went gluten-free, and she lost 25 pounds. Most of the time I say, well, what are you cutting out if you go gluten-free? I've cut out cookies. I've cut out chips. I've cut out a lot of junk foods. I've cut out excess bread. So typically I see people losing weight because they've cut food out. But gluten-free is not necessarily the answer for a lot of people. Just because I go gluten-free does not mean I'm healthy, does not mean I'm going to lose weight. Kind of depends on what else I do with it. 
So unless you have celiac disease, gluten intolerance, or IBS, it's not low calorie, it's not necessarily a healthier diet, can cause constipation. No one wants that because you're not getting a lot of fiber in there. It's not anti-inflammatory and it is lower in nutrients. You actually want to eat more grains. We know through tons of research that these whole grains reduce your risk of diabetes, reduce your risk of heart disease. So grains do not cause inflammation, as many popular books would have you believe. Helps reduce 20 to 30 percent risk reduction of, of developing type 2 diabetes. That's huge. And people who consume three to five servings a day of whole grains have 21 percent less risk of cardiovascular disease. Yay, bread! <laughs> Yay, whole grains! So these actually are very, very awesome foods for us. The problem is that we usually eat too much. Another myth out there is avoiding dairy. This is a newer one. It's come about in the past like two or three years. If you Google dairy plus health, 139 million sites about how dairy is not awesome for you. So we've heard our whole lives, we need to drink milk, right? The pro for dairy, the thumbs up for dairy, it's vital for bone health, essential for muscles and healthy skin, defends against obesity. There are studies out there about how dairy intake can reduce BMI diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. The people who are on the anti-dairy side say it could increase cancer risk, increase cardiovascular risk. It's a, irrelevant to bone health, could be detrimental. It's abusive to cows or the planet. Um, dairy intake is sim simply unnatural. We're the only mammal who drinks another mammal's bodily fluids. We're the only mammals who do a lot of things. We're the only mammals who can do like algebra, as far as I know. <laughs> So this is just the, the, the anti-people, it's just what I had seen on the internet, so I'm not necessarily saying that's true. What is true? Should I avoid dairy? Well, it depends on if you, if you have problems with dairy. If you're lactose intolerant, I would have asked you to avoid dairy. That's not going to be very comfortable for your GI tract. It depends on how much you're eating or what kind of dairy. Am I having a low-fat Chobani yogurt or am I having a Trix yogurt that's 400 calories? So what am I omitting to accommodate dairy? Am I getting rid of my fruits and vegetables to have Trix yogurt? So avoiding dairy could actually be more of a personal issue. There's clear evidence that dairy is not essential to our health. What is essential to our health that we get from dairy? Calcium. So you guys know you can get calcium from lots of other sources. What we know is that populations who drink mostly water, eat mostly plants, plant-based diet, Exercise routinely, get sunlight, tend to have strong bones, tend to have strong hearts, low rates of cancer, stroke, and diabetes. Not really attributed to dairy. However, in the United States, we have low activity levels. We have low protein intake, and therefore we have seen dairy being associated with better bones. So what this is saying is if you choose to omit, omit dairy, I'm going to ask you to get some exercise in there. Keep your muscles strong. Eat some plants. Get some sunlight. From sunlight, we synthesize vitamin D. Your body makes vitamin D, and vitamin D is needed to help your body absorb calcium. So omitting dairy, once again, personal choice. It's not necessarily the root of all evil, but we can also get calcium from other sources. So if you like dairy, I'm going to ask you, which one should you choose if we're going to have dairy? We want to go for our low-fat dairy, our high-protein dairy. We don't necessarily want to go for those tricks for kind of kids' yogurts that may have a lot of sugar and not a lot of calcium in there. Oh, I love this one. Juicing. This is huge, this juicing thing. So I found this on the Internet, this Earth's Remedy Top 15 Reasons to Juice. You guys heard of this? Or some of these things. You can detox your body. You can have weight loss. It'll boost your immune system, reduce your blood pressure, reduce your cholesterol. Reverse is aging. Well, who doesn't want that? <laughs> Hydrate your body. Regulate your body's pH. So I also Googled this and found these three myths. Juicing is better for you than eating the whole fruit and vegetable because your body absorbs nutrients better and gives your digestive system a rest. Juicing can reduce your risk of cancer, boost your immune system, help remove toxins from your body, aid digestion, and help you lose weight. Juicing will help me lose weight. So it's kind of a theme here. So to address this first one, I love this. It gives your digestive system a rest. Why does your digestive system need a rest? Like that's what it's supposed to do. It doesn't need to rest. 
Juicing will reduce your risk of cancer, immune system, et cetera, et cetera. You know what else does that? Fruit and vegetables, like the whole fruit and vegetables. You don't have to put it through a juicer to get the same effects. So there's no scientific evidence at all that juice is better absorbed than the actual fruit or vegetable. I would much rather you eat the actual fruit or vegetable. What are you going to feel more full on? The whole fruit or vegetable. You also get no fiber when you juice. Whenever I put a fruit or veggie through a, a juicy machine, I crush all the fiber, so I lose all the fiber. So I don't feel very full. Whereas if I just ate that orange or ate that zucchini, I'm going to get more fiber in there. Juicing can also be very expensive. You put a lot of, of produce into that juicer and come with a small little glass. So if you're juicing primarily fruit, it can be very high calorie and very high sugar. And look at this. To make eight ounce glass of juice, it takes two oranges or four tomatoes, one whole pineapple. It's going to make that much juice. Four apples or one bunch of carrots. I would rather you eat one whole pineapple. You're probably not going to eat a whole pineapple. <laughs> or four tomatoes. You probably will not eat four tomatoes. So um, if you don't mind, we're going to have questions at the very end if that's okay. But hold on to that, though. Another thing I love is that it says it's going to clean or detox our body. Your body is cleansing and detoxing itself 24 hours a day. This is what your liver and your kidneys and your spleen are designed to do. So detoxing sometimes can put your body at nutritional risk if I'm only doing juices and I'm not getting good proteins or calcium in there. A lot of people just feel irritated and tired. It's not sustainable. How long can I just drink juice for the rest of my life? I couldn't do it. So there's no truth that you retain any waste in your colon. And like I said, your body is detoxing itself. I think juice can be a really great option. If I don't like to have vegetables, I don't like how they taste, but I can juice them and I'm still going to get those really great vitamins and minerals, excellent. If you like to do juice and that's my breakfast in the morning, it can still be excellent. I'm not saying that you can't do this. I'm saying it's not something we should rely on for all of our nutrition. Supplements. This is a huge one. Those weight loss supplements or any other kind of supplements we may see out there. I always say there's no such thing as a free lunch. Can't get something for nothing. So people taking weight loss medication that's over the counter, first of all, I don't know what's in those pills. And neither does a lot of other people. Supplements that are on the market are not regulated by the FDA, which means they could have some ingredients in there that no one really knows what they are. The FDA will look into a supplement after a claim is, is made, like if you have a complaint and you want to complain to the FDA about the supplement, then they will look into it because there's too many on the market. There's too many that pop up daily, so they can't keep track of all of them until a problem occurs. So looking at weight loss supplements, I always say, if taking a pill for weight loss would work, then everyone would be thin, and that pill would probably cost a million dollars. <laughs> and you'll always see at the bottom results, not typical. So additionally, with the multiple medications that we're on, being on an immunosuppressed diet, some of these supplements, whether it's a weight loss pill or any other over-the-counter, could have some side effects, could interfere with my current medication. So a lot of these cause elevated heart rate, heart palpitations, insomnia, headaches, and like I said, interfering with your current medication. So always, always, always want to talk to my doctor, even if it's an over-the-counter calcium supplement, biotin supplement, or weight loss supplement, I want to talk to my physician and make sure it's not going to have any harmful side effects with me. This is one of my favorite slides. If you want to investigate a great brand or should I be taking this, these are some excellent, excellent resources and databases to kind of investigate your supplements. Oh, my other favorite, sugar's the enemy. Sugar's bad, right? We shouldn't be doing sugar. I actually got into a conversation with one of my co-dietitians this week, and she said, I tell people that sugar's poison, and they shouldn't be having poison. And I got a little mad about that. Is sugar poison? You know what is poison? Like arsenic's poison? There's lots of me. I'm not going to drink gasoline. So when you Google sugar, these are the top five phrases. Sugar's poison, sugar's bad, sugar's a drug, it's toxic, and it's killing us. The top five things that came up when I did this Google search. So I'd have the stance, just me personally, that sugar is not poison. It's the dose of it that we need to watch out for. So however, we do know that sugar may be a culprit in obesity and diabetes. But look at how much we're getting. The average adult is getting 22 to 28 teaspoons of added sugar per day. 
That is about 88 to 112 grams of sugar per day. Added sugar, I'm not talking about what's naturally occurring. And naturally occurring sugar is what's in our milk, which is lactose, and what's in our fruit, which is fructose. This is added sugar. Where does added sugar come from? Think about our candy, our ice cream, our junk foods. That's added sugar, that tricks yogurt. 88 to 112 grams of sugar per day is about 350 to 450 extra calories that we're getting. And that's where the problem's coming in. So it's not necessarily that having one little mini candy bar a day is going to do me in. It's the fact that most of us are having 12 or 14 of those mini candy bars a day. There are tons of names for sugar. Brown sugar, corn syrup, high fructose concentrations, or high fructose corn syrup, honey, raw syrup, <clears throat> excuse me, raw sugar. Anything ending in the letters O-S-E, dextrose, fructose, glucose, lactose, all these different names. That's a lot. So when we look at a food label, we can't list all of these. So we list them all under that word sugar. So when I see a food label and I see sugar and it has X amount of grams, it's talking about these added sugars, but it's also including my lactose and my fructose in there. So it can be a little confusing sometimes to just look at that label where it says sugar. But no matter what I'm getting, about a tablespoon is around 60 calories. Whether it's sugar in the raw or honey or malt sugar or molasses, it's about 60 calories per tablespoon. So it adds up pretty quickly. It's an excess. Like anything, in excess is going to cause a problem. Added sugar increases our risk of heart disease, even if I'm not overweight. It increases my risk of obesity, type 2 diabetes, fatty liver, hypertension. Your lipids increase. I'm sorry, that arrow's out of place. So the American Heart Association has given us some guidelines. For women, it's about 24 grams of added sugar a day. For men, it's about 36 grams of added sugar per day. Sorry, ladies. Men just metabolize things better than we do. Men. But one gram of sugar is around four calories. So in a 12-ounce soda, there's 40 grams of sugar, which is about 10 teaspoons or about 160 calories from straight sugar. That's a lot of sugar. So knowing that the Heart Association recommended 24 grams and that one soda is 40 grams, I've already gotten two days' worth of sugar in there in one soda. So that's what I mean by it's the dose. It's how much that we're doing that becomes the problem. So how to spot these diet myths? They pop up every day, and they come and they go. So take a step back, look at the evidence, be skeptical, ask. Ask your physician, ask your dietitian. Look for red flags. Is a diet asking me to omit a healthy food group? You can never eat bananas. Well, why? Bananas are a wonderful food for you. Or you can never eat beans. But unless you have GI problems, beans are wonderful for you. However, if a diet's asking you to omit something like sugar, that may be a little bit different. Think critically. If I'm only allowed to eat bananas, if I also have an orange food group with it and I can only eat it on the third full moon after the month, that may be a little crazy. And remember, there's no magic bullets. There's no magic diet. There's no magic foods. It's really about overall healthy eating and making healthy eating a habit. So when we talk about making a habit, people are like, I want to make healthy eating a habit. Why is it not a habit? Why can I can't do this? Well, think about the habits you do in your life. Brushing my teeth is a habit. Watching TV, kissing my husband good morning. These are habits. Why are they habits? Because I've been doing them for a long time. Why is healthy eating not a habit? Because I haven't been doing it for a long time. So just like anything, I have to keep practicing. I have to do this over and over daily for it to become a habit. So why is healthy eating not a habit? I'm not doing it all the time. So I don't have to make healthy eating overwhelming. I can just make small changes. Don't expect too much too soon. can take about a month for it to start to become a habit. But we're going to talk about things you can do every day, just some small changes here or there we can do to improve our diet. One, get a grasp on what your healthy eating habits are. So how many times have you guys heard this, do a food diary? It's my favorite. I think they tell every dietitian in school, this is what you have to tell everyone, do a food diary. But well, why do you think we ask you to do a food diary? Who's ever done one? Did it help? Were you paying more attention to what you ate? Who tracks their bank account? Your money. Hopefully everyone's tracking your money. <laughs> 
What happens if you don't track your bank account and your money? You are soon broke. So it's the same thing. I ask you to look at your food diary the same way I'm going to look at my bank account. I know how much I have. I know how much I can spend. I know what my freedoms are here or there. A food diary helps keep you accountable, helps keep you aware. You start to understand your eating habits and where your problem areas come in. I've noticed that every single day this week I have not had one vegetable. I didn't realize that. Maybe I'll start bringing a vegetable in here or there. It doesn't have to be three times a day. Or, you know what, I've been having some stomach problems and some GI problems for the past week. I'm going to start writing down everything I eat. And I start to notice every time I have yogurt, I'm not feeling so great. So I like to use a food diary as being a food detective. You're figuring out where I can make improvements or where some problems are coming in. So you may not realize how good or how bad your present eating habits are until you see them right there in front of you. So these are some of my favorite food diaries. The online ones are really popular these days. I can keep a food diary on my phone or I can keep it on the computer. These are just a couple of different ones, even if I'm writing it down. If I choose to get a pen and paper and write it down, don't get some old ratty napkin, but you're going to lose that. Get a nice, pretty notebook that you like, sparkles on it or superheroes, whatever. You're drawn to it physically. You'll be more likely to go write it down. Keep that notebook on your kitchen table, on your dining room table, in my lunch bag, wherever it is you eat, and write it down as you eat. Number two, adding plant power. This is where that plant-based diet comes in. A plant-based diet means most of your foods are coming from plants, from fruits, and from vegetables. My protein sources may be lean proteins, maybe beans. Some people like tofu. Not on a neutropenic diet, but afterwards if you want to have some tofu. We know that increasing your fruits and vegetables decreases risk of cancer, lowers your risk of type 2 diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, helps you maintain a healthy weight. Plants produce natural, amazing compounds called polyphenols and flavonoids. There's not a test. You will not need to remember those words. But these are compounds in fruits and vegetables that give them their bright, beautiful flavor and also give you amazing nutrition. Like you might have heard, eat your carrots, it'll help your vision. We know that orange fruits and vegetables help with your eyesight. We know that red fruits and vegetables help with your heart. So all these wonderful fruits and vegetables are, are nature's way of telling you that they are doing great things for you. Third easy thing you can do, ditch the junk. I always say, you are not a garbage can. Why are you putting garbage in? So what kinds of food is our garbage? Our highly processed foods. These are things like Doritos and Twinkies and M&Ms and our junk foods. We get nothing from them. You might have heard that word empty calorie before. Empty calorie means it's giving me calories, but I get no nutrition. I get nothing back from it. To me, that's the same as taking a $20 bill and lighting it on fire. I just wasted it. I don't want to do that. I want to get something back from it. And I hear this one a lot. You know, I would get rid of the chips, but my kids want them. And if I get rid of chips, my kids are going to be so awful. And I always say, your kids don't need this stuff either. No kid out there needs a Twinkie. No kid out there needs Doritos. So trying to be careful when those are in the house are kind of putting the blame on the kids. Another reason to get rid of this junk, they don't keep you full. Who's ever eaten a Twinkie and felt full? Who's ever eaten a Twinkie and you just want another one? <laughs> so these foods don't keep you full. They just kind of create the desire to eat more and more. So this is actually what our plate should look like. Half of your plate should be vegetables, those non-starchy, amazing vegetables. If you don't like cooked carrots, you don't got to eat cooked carrots. One-fourth of your plate should be those whole grains. Now think about how small that one-fourth of your plate is. It's about one cup of rice or one cup of pasta. The other fourth of your plate, that's my lean protein. So when I sit down to a plate like this, I'm already visually looking at this going, yeah, that's a lot of food. As opposed to those diets we've gone on where you sit down and you're just immediately like, I'm sad, that's all I get to eat. There's a lot of food right there. Whatever you do, don't miss the big picture. We have these skewed priorities, meaning I'm not, I can't have canned peaches. I have to have fresh organic peaches, or frozen peaches are bad. Eating any peach is still better than eating no peach at all, whether it's canned or frozen or organic or you grew it in your backyard. It's still better than eating a candy bar. I read an article 
um, in the Atlantic, and I'm paraphrasing, I'm quoting here, excuse me, about a cardiologist who had a patient come in, the patient's like, doctor, I know I should be eating salmon, it's so good for my heart, but now there's all these farm-raised salmon, or organic salmon, I don't know which salmon to do, so therefore I haven't been eating any salmon. And the doctor stood back and he said, stop smoking. So we get kind of caught up in the food, and juicing is better than this, and this is better than that, and we miss the big picture. So what's the one thing that you can do today to improve your diet? Maybe it's something you heard here today. Maybe it's I'm going to stop eating M&Ms. Maybe it's that I'm going to start eating more salad. Or if I'm going to have some brown rice, I'll watch my portion of it. So go for the low-hanging fruit, for lack of a better phrase. Pick something easy that you guys can change. These are some resources that I had for you. Um, the My Fitness Pals, my favorite online food diary. The Heart Association has fantastic recipes and healthy eating ideas. Um, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute also has some wonderful um, ideas on there. At the bottom, SkinnyTaste.com, my favorite, favorite recipe website. This lady who runs this should pay me because I advertise for her like every day. <laughs> but amazing recipes that are easy. That's key. Easy recipes. Whew, and that's my time. <laughs> All right, so... We are going to take some questions. So if you don't mind, this is being recorded, so that's why we want to stay with the microphone. So if you have a question, just please go to this microphone in the middle. That way everyone can hear, um, and we'll get your questions answered. Your turn. I'd just like to say thank you to Holly. How many of us would like to take her home and just have her in our kitchen? <laughs> <laughs> Amazing energy and just a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Well, I tell you what, if we have any questions, just please come to this microphone, that way we can all hear it. And you've been waiting for a while. Yes, I have a question. You were talking about the juicing diet. Um, we have a Nutribullet, and that grinds everything up, but are you still getting all the fiber with that? You should, yes, absolutely. So things like a Vitamix or a Nutribullet, it does grind it up, but you should still be getting the fiber in there. It's the actual juicer machine. Have you ever seen those okay. juicers? That's what's going to get rid of the fiber. So the Nutribullet is good. And like my husband has had colon cancer, but then he's got the IBS too. Mm -hmm. So would that Nutribullet be good for him as far as the fiber and... Yes, that's an excellent, excellent idea. So what she was saying, he has colon cancer, and usually colon cancer, a lot of fiber kind of causes some issues. Mm -hmm. So that'd be a great way for him to get some fiber in there, but it's going to be a little bit more easily digested. Absolutely. Wonderful. All right. Thank you. No problem. Yes, just kind of curious if yeah. you had any opinions on the... Uh, uh, appropriateness of stevia, a uh, natural uh, substance that does have sweetening capabilities. Mm -hmm. Some people find it repulsive, <laughs> but otherwise. And uh, let's see, I had a whole list, but apple cider vinegar, I'm just curious about that. Uh, in terms of uh, some of the experiences I've had, I've learned that if I keep my mouth healthy and my gut healthy, mm -hmm. uh, that goes a long way to balancing out the whole system. Absolutely. So that's a, that's a great way to think of it. If I, think, if I keep my mouth healthy and my gut healthy, it goes a long way to balancing the system. So two questions. One, he asked about stevia. I love stevia. Artificial sweeteners. I didn't touch on this. It's such a controversial issue. So artificial sweeteners, use them if you want. Don't use them if you want. The research out there on artificial sweeteners is that they're fine. So all the things we hear in media that they're going to make you grow three or four heads, not true. So this is one of the most research chemical components out there. It's been researched for over 50 years. The research is done on mice and rats, and we have seen some issues with the mice and the rats. But if you look at the research, mice and rats are fed about three times their body weight daily. So like I said, everything in excess is a problem. If you eat three times your body weight daily in stevia, you're going to have a problem. If you have three times your body weight in water daily, you're going to have a problem. So right now, the research has said these are actually okay for you. The FDA took what was happening in labs and reduced it down and figured out what's the safe amount for adults. Right now, in equal, the safe amount is no more than 96 packets a day. 
So in Splenda and Stevia, it's oh. no more than 25 packets a day. That's a lot, right? That's still over 100 times less than what was used in research. So I don't want to bore you guys with research, but what we're getting from that is in humans, we have not seen problems. My take on it is 10 years from now, we could find something different. So if you don't want to use it, if you feel weird, then don't use it. If it's a great substitute for you, I like to put Stevia in my coffee, it's been found to be safe. It's generally recognized as safe. Is so. It is. So stevia comes from, well, stevia is a plant. So you might have heard and people say, oh, trivia, it's more, it's more natural. But yet it has been processed. So when I open up a box of stevia, I don't have a plant coming out. So stevia is being grouped in with our artificial sweetener. So it's, it's being similar, compared similarly to Splenda. So it's fine. I think if anyone is having 96 packets of equal a day, we have a problem. Mm -hmm. um, but I do tend to caution people. I say, you know, no, no one should have six Diet Cokes a day. One Diet Coke a day, a couple Diet Cokes a week, that should be okay. So I still encourage you to limit it. Um, don't go crazy with it. So, but it's, it's fine for that long explanation. Um, as far as apple cider vinegar, once again, the research hasn't really supported that we're getting a lot of benefits from apple cider vinegar, but it's not going to hurt you. So anecdotally, I have people who take it and they love it and they say it helps me control my weight, helps me control other things, I feel better. Excellent. If you feel better taking it, then take it. It's not going to hurt you. But if you're not taking it, we haven't seen the research to say you should start taking it. We haven't seen a lot of benefits come from it. So. It was a long talk, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a few questions, mm -hmm. so I'll try and make it quick. But back to the artificial sweetener discussion. Um, is aspartame this in the same category as Splenda and Stevia, or is that a separate? It's separate. Actually, aspartame is equal. And that's the one that's, that's uh, the suggested amounts no more than 96 packets a day. Now, some people have said aspartame will give me headaches or I feel weird on aspartame. And I say, well, then don't have it. Um, aspartame is, is equal. Um, Splenda is sucralose. And then stevia is from the stevia plant. So they are different. They're all considered artificial mm -hmm. sweeteners. Artificial sweeteners are okay in moderation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my skinny lattes are okay. They're fine. <laughs> okay. They're fine. Yeah. Um, okay. So... I have heard um, a lot of talk about sugar causing cancer or um, cancer feeding off of sugar. Mm -hmm. Is there truth to that? There's actually not truth to that. That's an excellent question because that comes around so much. Every cell in your body needs sugar. There's not one cell in your body that does not use sugar. In our body, it's called glucose. So even if I eat sugar, if you have a tablespoon of sugar right now, it's going to turn to glucose in your body. The problem with cancer, if we think about a tumor, it's multiple cells. So in one area, I've got a lot of cells, and they're all using sugar. And cancerous tumors do grow. So that's where that thought process came from. But we haven't really seen any truth to that in the research that sugar is causing cancer or making your cancer cells grow. Every cell in your body needs it. Okay. I'm still going to encourage you to be careful with your sugar intake because, right. you know, it's, it's still sugar. Crappy okay. food. Um, and then... As far as the neutropenic diet goes, so I'm four years post-transplant. Um, Fantastic. Thank you. Um, but I'm still on all my immunosuppressions. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been told to still follow that neutropenic diet. Mm -hmm. but raw nuts, is, this is the first time I've heard that that is... Right. No, no. <laughs> so can we? T can you tell me why that's bad? You know, it's once again you think about your raw nuts. Have they been just pulled off the tree and eaten them, or have they kind of gone through more of a processing? So when I look at raw nuts, it's kind of like just eating them off the tree. If you have like some raw almonds that are from like Blue Diamond, you should be fine because they have gone through some treatment to make sure there's no bacteria on there. Okay. So that's really what it is. Okay. Um. And beer. <laughs> Love it. Um. <laughs> 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 uh, you remember early on that I was told that beer was something that um, I should stay away from because mm -hmm. of the whole pasteurized versus non-pasteurized. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the like long term is there a point when you can start drinking drinking beer again? Um, it's it's and I did say this in the beginning. A lot of people will be on neutropenic diets longer than those three months because of your medications. It's the pasteurization, so you can start to look into. There are certain companies, usually our bigger beer brands, are pasteurizing their beer. Sometimes locally home brewed brands is kind of what we're watching out for. But there are brands we can we can look up for you. I don't know them off the top of my head, but the, think about the big the big brands we're, we're familiar with. It's, it's the pasteurization. Okay, is this one of those things that like a little bit in moderation is okay, or is it? Like, absolutely, you should not have. 
Um, I would say, I think a little in moderation is okay. I'm always going to encourage you to talk to your physician. Okay. The, the problem with the neutropenic diet is we're just reducing the risk that you're going to come in contact with something that you're not going to be able to fight off. So like things that are unpasteurized, I may come in contact with some bacteria that I can't fight off. So once again, if we're looking for those pasteurized beers, you may be able to have some in moderation just kind of and see what happens. Okay. Your doctors may say avoid it altogether. Okay. Thank so, you so much. Yeah. What about wine? <laughs> wine? Yeah, and wine is fermented. So, I mean... Don't make wine in your backyard. Don't stamp on your own grapes, but wine should be fine. Darn. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question about mm -hmm. the natural standard database. Um, I've used that through a work setting in the past, and I'm not, I can't access that anymore. Mm -hmm. My understanding was you had to buy a membership. Do you still? You know, I don't know, and because I access it at work. Um, and we have never had to buy a membership, but that may be something I'm just not familiar with. So I'm so sorry. Okay. But hopefully there's some other ones there that you can. I'm okay. not familiar. I'm so sorry. Um, in our family, we deal with um, dairy intolerance. I have mm. two family members. And what, what is the best information resource for that? For dairy intolerance? Mm -hmm. As far as like looking for food you can eat or... Well, can't. Um, so that you you have the, um, as much protein as you should through those kind of things. What's the best replacement product? Well, if like look almond milk or cashew yeah. milk or what's the best? So I love almond milk and cashew milk. I always encourage you to do the unsweetened type of almond and cashew milk. The problem there is they don't have protein in them. We think they should, but they don't. But if I'm getting protein from other sources, then it can be fine to have that. So most of us aren't getting the majority of our protein intake from a milk product anyways, unless you're drinking a lot of milk per day, which I don't meet that many people who are. Mm -hmm. So as long as I'm getting my protein intake from other sources, an average adult needs somewhere between 75 and 100 grams of protein per day. So it's fine to do almond and cashew milk. Some people will do soy milk, once again a controversial issue, but if you choose soy, if you like soy, soy does have protein in there, and soy milk has a lot of calcium. Okay. As almond milk has a lot of calcium too. Mm -hmm. So. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah. Okay. Oh, well, also the products that have added calcium. Mm -hmm. um, my husband is this transplant survivor, mm -hmm. and his calcium tends to run low mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. So, and he has a lot of leg cramps. So I was trying to buy things that mm -hmm. have that more calcium more in there. Calcium. Is that really a good source? It can be. When, when your labs are really low for anyone, if they're really too low, sometimes food won't always bring it up, and we do need to talk to your doctor about supplements, mm -hmm. if a calcium supplement would be appropriate. Yeah. Um, because depending on how low your levels are, food's not going to bring it up. Yeah. Because yeah. I can get calcium from other things, like broccoli has calcium in it, mm -hmm. but not a huge amount. And dairy mm -hmm. is definitely our highest amount of calcium in there. Okay. But like I said, um, almond milk has calcium, and soy milk has a great source of calcium. Okay. Um, he, he just runs on low, normal, okay. or just below, okay, that's and good. does take uh, a couple tums a day, okay. but um, hasn't gone to the, an actual calcium um, substitute mm -hmm. because he has GI issues from pain medication. Yeah, yeah. So. And if, he, if you're just running, like she said, normal but low normal, then food would be a great way to bring that up. Okay. Definitely. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Hi. First of all, thank you so much for your time. Sure. Um, I am a transplant survivor, Yay. one year and five months. Congrats. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a question for you. I am getting back into my life, and I'm have, I find that I am having the post-transplant weight gain. Mm -hmm. And I'm also finding that I have a hard time eating healthy at work. Mm -hmm. I tend to, like, stress eat, and then I'm running to the Walgreens, and what do I go for? Instead of the apple, I go for the chocolate bar and the of soda. Of course, of course. So I'm just wondering if you have any tips... Um, specifically for transplant survivors mm -hmm. on what we should be, you know, guiding mm -hmm. ourselves towards as yeah. far as good nutrition, especially on the go at work. On the go is hard. And this, yeah. is a, this happens to a lot of people, and maybe some of you in here can identify with her. Work is work's hard. Um, so obviously if you know there's a certain time of day, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I want something sweet. I want to fix this. Then we need to work on potentially bringing some stuff with you, some more healthy options to keep at work. If it's there with me, I'm probably not going to run to Walgreens and get it. I can have every intention in the world to go to Walgreens and get that apple, but once you're down there, I don't think anyone's going to actually get the apple. So if you're in that stress. So the first thing is to do kind of prevent yourself from going down there. So I've got some snacks here. I'm going to eat my healthy snacks. Sit on it for 20 or 30 minutes. If 20 or 30 minutes later, I really want to go get that, that 
chocolate treat, then I might allow myself to go get it. But usually once I eat the healthy snack and I sit on it for 20 or 30 minutes, you're like, okay, I can do it, I'm all right. That mm -hmm. urge has passed. Mm -hmm. So usually at 20 or 30 minute time, our urges tend to creep and then come back down in like 20 minutes. So trying to keep some stuff with you there at work too. Okay. Um, do you have like a refrigerator or mm -hmm. something you can keep some stuff? Mm -hmm. So you don't just have to bring like carrot sticks with you. Um, I can, if you, um, I don't know if my contact information is on here, like my email address is on here. I have tons and tons of like meal ideas and snack ideas. I'd be more than happy to send you guys if anyone would want them. Um, so I'd be happy to give you my email or a business card. I can send you some of those ideas too. So also keeping track, and I guess I'm gonna go back to that food diary. When people are kind of keeping track like on my fitness pal, and I'm given like a 1500 calorie limit, and I really want a candy bar, go get the candy bar. I will add that 200 calories into my 1500 calories per day, and as long as I'm in my calories, I'll still be losing weight. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's not a matter of working around it, it's working it in. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I had a quick second question. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about this controversy, um, organic vegetables and fruits versus non-organic? So uh, when I got cancer, uh, you know, my mom was doing all this reading and stuff, and she was like, you can't have anything that's not organic. <laughs> Don't touch that. I haven't washed it yet. And so now I tend to be afraid of right. non-organic vegetables and fruits. And that, that gets very expensive yes, at the grocery it does. store. It does. First of all, you have a wonderful mother who's looking out for you. So thanks, Mom. If she's here, tell her. <laughs> organic is a personal choice. So organic is not healthier than non-organic. They kind of have similar... Um, composition. We have seen a little bit difference, but pretty similar composition. The difference in organic is that they, in the farming techniques, they don't use as many pesticides, and so that kind of becomes an issue. And usually, like on a neutropenic diet, sometimes you do watch out for that, but it's just a pesticide issue. However, organic farming, they still use pesticides. <coughs> so there's three approved pesticides. So when you go to Whole Foods, that's how they've had pesticides on there, just three approved organic pesticides. It's just a whole lot less than your conventional farming. Mm -hmm. There are fruits and vegetables that doesn't matter if you get organic because think about a banana. I'm not gonna eat the banana skin. So an organic banana and a regular banana on the inside tend to be the same. Doesn't, the pesticide hasn't leached through. We usually think about the thin skin things we tend to eat, like a strawberry or an apple. Then people are thinking, okay, the pesticides have leached through that skin and have kind of gotten into the fruit a little bit more. So if you want to go organic, there's some things you could, more like I want to eat apples or plums or peppers, but I don't need to buy like organic watermelon or organic bananas necessarily because we don't eat those skins. Um, it's, it's just a personal choice, really. We really haven't seen the standard conventional techniques causing any problems. Okay. So does that help? Yes, it does. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> right. and it's a lot more expensive. It really is. My, um, pretty much the only thing I like to buy at home is I buy organic milk, not because I think regular is wrong, but the organic milk tends to last longer. I'm not real sure why, but it lasts longer in our house. Well, I, you what? I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, a suggestion. Mm-hmm. So she had a great suggestion. She was saying that usually when she feels like she's hungry, she'll drink a bottle of water first, and it kind of helps fill up her stomach a little bit. So we got two minutes left. I think time okay. for our last two questions. All right, um, this is real quick. Yeah. I have a sweet tooth, and so I've looked a lot into stevia. And so last summer, I grew my own in my front yard, wow. and I dried it, and it is not artificial. So That's you fantastic. can't call it that. Where it gets confused is that when you buy it dried in a store, most stores add a preservative to it, and then it gets classified as artificial. If you buy it liquid, the drops in a bottle, usually they don't add, but you can, you know, look at it or grow it in your own front yard and dry it. It's not artificial. That's fantastic. So if you grow it yourself, it's grown yourself. When we buy it in a packet like with Truvia, that's when it's been processed and changed, and that's when it is artificial. But um, that's fantastic. I don't think I could grow my own. Awesome. Hello. I also have an issue with gaining weight after transplant. I, I actually am a member of the Fitness Pal online. Fantastic. Um, I talk all the time with my dietitian back at home. Awesome. Um, I'm perplexing mm -hmm. to them because it's not an overeat. I actually don't like to eat. Um, so I have recently heard from a support group 
after specific chemos, um, specifically ERAC, it seems like more people are having weight gain issues after specific types of chemo. So are you familiar with any of the? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> You're just shaking your head, yes. It's, it sucks. So yeah, we there do. is truth to that. Yes. We, um, so after certain types of chemos, um, we do tend to see some kind of bodily and hormonal alterations that can affect weight gain, sometimes unexplained, and can make it extremely difficult to lose weight. It's not true for every single person, so you do need to kind of be evaluated by your dietitian, and we'll kind of put you through like the standard, like let's track your calories, let's just make sure to rule everything out. But yes, I have heard that, and yes, it does kind of stink. So then what we kind of do is fight to not gain more weight. We just kind of fight to stay where you are. As time goes on, we tend to see that resolving a little bit, but that's been different for different people so yeah you know my oncologist they don't really care because I'm <laughs> healthy. healthy for them I'm healthy <laughs> right. and my cancer is not back yeah and they just kind of laugh at me because everybody else can't keep weight on right and so I it's, just wanted to confirm that it is and, and that's a common misconception people think because you go through chemo you lose weight because we see that on TV and I see a lot of people gaining weight after those treatments um, we do in our clinic we work with an endocrinologist who specializes in weight management and endocrine and she says a lot of patients who struggle with this like I said until we can find a better solution it's really focusing on that gaining more weight and staying as healthy as we can mm -hmm. keeping my muscles strong following a healthy diet and continuing to fight it but you're not crazy okay. I'm sorry thank you <laughs> All right, so I think our time is up. If anybody has any more questions, I'll be around here for about 15 more minutes. You can definitely come in and chit-chat if you want to. Thank you so much. Thank you all. I have one announcement. Uh, this concludes your first morning session. There is a 15-minute passing break, so please visit the exhibits and stop by the silent auction table uh, to bid on some wonderful items, and then the next session starts in 15 minutes. Thank you all.